sorry for all that I've done I'm just a sinner Saved by your love Though I'm broken You make me strong I'm only human With help from above you called my name Forever I'm healed by grace Whenever I fall You're always waiting for me Oh, you're waiting for me Every day I need you, Jesus You are
It's green. It's green for go. Okay, we're good to go. Good morning, everybody. Oh, my goodness. It's been a very long time since I stood on this stage. I know I've spoken to you, but um, I've been speaking to you from behind a screen, and it was much less scary to just record it and shove it out there and not really know how you were reacting to it. Um, but it's really good to be back. For anybody who doesn't know me, I have been hanging around here for a little while now, so most of you will. Uh, my name's Sarah. Uh, my husband and I have been part of Grosvenor for about 10 years now, and uh, we now have three children that we've added to, the, to, added to our big family. Um, I'm here to talk to you this morning. My title that I was given was, Who is Jesus? Is Jesus God? <sighs> and I found that, I was like, Nick, could you not have given me an easier one? Um, so I just started praying and was like, oh, how do I unpack this? Because I just know that Jesus is God. I know because I've experienced him. I know that, I know because of how he works in my life. And and I was praying, Jesus, what what do you want me to say here? And he said, well, first of all, we're going to change the title. So that's what we did. So the title is not going to be, Is Jesus God? We're going to call our, our sermon this morning, The Fact That Jesus Is God Changes Everything. And that's how we're going to start. Um. I'm really sorry if I get a bit breathless. Unfortunately, Nick and I had COVID about three weeks ago and I still can't completely fill my lungs with air, so I might have to stop every now and again. So most people will acknowledge that Jesus existed in history. Even if you don't know Jesus, even for all those people out there who have no idea what we're talking about this morning, they can see that Jesus did exist. There was a first century Jewish Jewish historian called Flavius Just. Josephus, probably somebody will correct me on that later, um, who says about Pontius Pilate, he says, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it is lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of good, wonderful works, a teacher of such men as receive the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. And then he goes on to talk about his crucifixion, his crucifixion and his alleged resurrection in his words. So he's, he is well documented and he's, he was fully man. We know that he didn't come to kind of pretend at this. He ate and drank, he sweat, he got tired, he suffered pain. He had all of those human emotions that we have. He, he loved and he was sad and he was joyous. Um, and he experienced all those things that we've experienced. He, he grew up in a family. He had an education. He had a job. He was tempted. He was bereaved. He suffered. He was tortured. And eventually he experienced death. Jesus said he was the son of God from the very word go. I'm going to throw some verses. I'm not expecting you to flick this fast. And um, I wasn't organized enough to do a PowerPoint. Sorry, guys. Um, but in John 8:58, he says, he existed before Abraham. 
In John 10, 30, he claims that he and his father are one. And in John 5, 17 to 18, he, he tells us that he's equal to his father. And this is big stuff. But anybody can say anything, right? I can stand here and I could say anything. I could claim whatever I wanted. It doesn't make it true. And now I'm just going to put this out here from the word go. I am no theologian. I have not been to Bible college. Probably most of you uh, in earthly terms are a lot more um, qualified to preach about this than I am this morning. I'm at the beginning of this journey um, learning what I'm about to say to you because like I just said at the beginning, I just know my Jesus. I just know he's Jesus. I know he's God. I know he's Lord of all. I know that he changes stuff. So I had to go backwards from that point and figure out why I know that, which is actually really useful, right? And, and next year, we're going to be doing the Alpha course, and we're going to be working through that as a church. And, and that's kind of where I've, I've started from, is that place of, if you don't know him, how do we know? So the first thing, don't be, don't be put off by the amount of pieces of paper. I've literally written everything in case I could completely run out of words, Um, is he fulfilled prophecy. All of this series is about Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we heard about that Wonderful Counselor part last week with Rach. No one else in the history of humanity has had an entire collection of books written about them before they were even born. There are more than 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, 300 specific mentions of someone who didn't exist. And we then watch them come true. We watch those things come to pass. That blew me away already. I don't have time to keep going about that, but... Wow, 300. I mean, I don't think anybody mentioned me at all before I was born. No one knew what I was going to do. Nobody knew who I was going to be. They, I didn't think they even knew my name until I like, came. I popped out, and there I was, and I became Sarah. Some of you might be really organized, and you might, you know, Sharice, might already have a name in her head. She might already know what she thinks her baby's going to be. But I'm sure we're not prophesying about it just yet. We're not saying, actually, this is exactly what's going to happen and what's going to come to pass, because we don't have that yet. This was just for Jesus. The second part was that Jesus' identity isn't based solely on what he says. It was based on what he does, what he did, and what he still does now. He left a whole lot of evidence that he was God. And we get to read about it, because we've got our beautiful word There was an article in The Spectator by Matthew Paris who described himself as an avowed atheist. So that's a good place to start, isn't it? And he said, I've got such huge respect for Jesus because his life was so radical, it was so inconvenient. He says, if Jesus had not existed, the church most certainly would not have invented him. And isn't that true? If the early church had wanted to invent a saviour, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have started in a damp cave with an unmarried woman. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have wanted to invent somebody who regularly hung out with those tax collectors. He regularly sought out the prostitutes. He regularly found those people on the edge of society that nobody wanted to talk to, and he went and, and, and spent time with them. I definitely know that if the early church had wanted to invent a saviour, they wouldn't have invented somebody who called out all those religious leaders for exactly what they were. They wouldn't have invented somebody who walked in the temple and knocked the tables across the room. He was so inconvenient, wasn't he? He was so radical. When Jesus left the earth, there were 120 people who still believed that he was God fervently. There might have been a few more We don't always hear about the women, but um, the men that were in the Bible, there was 120 of them, and there were 120 of them in that upper room praying on the day of Pentecost. Just 120, that's less than we have in this room right now. That's all that believed that he was God at that point. Today, there are more than 2 billion people in the world who believe that Jesus is God. 
and I think that's a, um, that's a fervent testament to me of his authenticity, that somebody who isn't even here, who isn't fighting for a place, can still be believed in by two billion people across the world. He recorded, well, the Bible records many, many miracles where Jesus reversed the laws of nature. He turned water into wine. He fed 5,000 people with, with five loaves and two fish. He healed so many sick people. He brought dead back to life. And I think sometimes as a church, not just us, as the bigger church, we hear those stories so many times. We hear them from, you know, I'm, I'm reading them to my two-year-old. We hear them from that point and we keep hearing them and we kind of lose what that means. I nearly brought some hovis, but I mean, I just didn't have enough hovis left in my house to bring you five loaves. But what does that actually look like? If I turned up this morning and said, guys, I'm actually not gonna let you go for lunch, but I've got five loaves of hovis and two mackerel and I'm gonna feed you all and you're all gonna go out and you're not gonna be hungry and there's gonna be loads left over, you would all laugh in my face. You're all very polite, but you would all laugh in my face because it's ridiculous. And that's what Jesus did. That's the Jesus we're talking about here. The Jesus who like, healed the sick. Somebody walked up behind him, touched his cloak and was immediately healed from an illness that nobody even knew about. Nobody knew how to heal. Done, gone. It isn't like a platitude. It isn't something that we can... <laughs> I think we're all guilty of it sometimes. Like, wasn't he lovely? Oh, wasn't Jesus lovely? Oh, he healed sick people. We're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> we need healing. I think a lot of us need healing this morning. I certainly need some healing. I've had lots of people praying for me already. We want to we see those miracles that Jesus was doing. But I think sometimes we hear it so often and we read it that we forget and don't completely comprehend what mighty God was doing in those moments. What did it actually look like? We talk about Jesus so casually that we forget that all of those miracles are evidence that he was God. He wasn't just acting. He wasn't calling on somebody else. He was doing those things. Thirdly, we're, we're jumping over to Hebrews now. If you want to join me, I'm going to let you because I need to have a sip of water and a breath. We're in Hebrews 4, verse 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He lived a totally sinless life. In the face of temptation, in the face of corruption, in the face of religion, in the face of so many things that could have led him astray, he was perfect. Something no one else has done, and something no one else, to my knowledge, has ever claimed to do either. There aren't a lot of people out there saying that they are sinless or that they've never done anything wrong. We, I don't think any of us in this room could say that. I certainly couldn't myself. But he's the only person in history who was perfect, and the only reason he can be perfect is because he is mighty God. And the last thing in this umbrella that we call Christianity and I'm calling it an umbrella because there are so many little offshoots now and there are so many parts that like to, you know, call themselves part of Christianity that have kind of missed some of this truth. There are some parts that would claim that Jesus wasn't God. But the ultimate proof that Jesus is God for me was his resurrection from the dead after his death on the cross. No one else has ever risen from the dead on their own. So there's my, uh, there's my evidence. But going back to that title, why does it matter? Why does any of that matter? Because the fact that Jesus is God changes everything. He goes from that baby boy born in the dirt to an unmarried woman to mighty God, miraculously carried and delivered by a virgin. He goes from a man who was that doer of good works that we heard about at the beginning to mighty God, 
Waymaker, miracle worker, light in darkness. He goes from being an interesting man, he was quite nice in history, to the bridge that makes it possible for us to step from over here to knowing mighty God, to knowing our Father. In Acts 4, it says salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And to have that eternal life, we need to trust in Jesus. We need to use that bridge. We all sin. We all mess up. We're all a little bit broken. We all fall short of God's perfect standard apart from Jesus. The consequence of our sin is death apart from Jesus because he has stopped that eternal separation from God and he's made it possible for us to go live with him forever. Because Jesus came and lived entirely human, but also entirely sinless. His death was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Because he defeated death by rising again, we can have eternal life in the presence of God when we put our trust in him. Now, that worship this morning, Dan and guys, that, oh, <laughs> wasn't that amazing, guys? And we've just declared that. I choose, in my circumstances, to trust that Jesus is mighty God. We are all trudging a little bit, I think. It's been a hard two years. Oh, it's been a hard two years, hey? <laughs> And it's for all different reasons. Some of us have got health issues. Some of us have got mental health problems now that have been caused by the last two years. Some of us have had those problems already and then they've just been amplified. Some of us have lost people and are bereaved. Some of us have got financial problems. Some of us need reconciliation. There are so many things. Some of us are incredibly lonely in a world where there has been so many lockdowns and isolations. but I choose, and it is a choice, to trust that Jesus is mighty God, that he is in every circumstance, he is in every situation, he reigns high over all of it. This is my last quote, I promise. But I can, uh, I started to read The Case for Christ, I know lots of you have already read it, Lee Strobel, and it says, in short, I didn't become a Christian because God promised I would have... <laughs> an even happier life than I had as an atheist. He never promised any such thing. Indeed, following him would inevitably bring divine demotions in the eyes of the world. Rather, I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God who proved his divinity by rising from the dead. That meant following him was the most rational and logical step I could possibly take. To believe Jesus is God is the first step. But lots of people believe lots of things and it doesn't have any consequence. To believe Jesus is God and invite him into your life means you get to encounter him for yourself. You get to find out who this Jesus is that I'm talking about. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It does not mean that all of those things go away. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you get to rock up at church shiny I would love that. I would really love it. But unfortunately, it doesn't mean that because I'm broken and I'm still broken. It just means I get to trust in mighty God who is with me every step of the way, who reigns high over every circumstance that we have. So if you know Jesus this morning, please know that you have an immeasurably great power ready to work in your life this morning. That same power that made Jesus' life so miraculous. That same power that rose him from the dead, that caused his resurrection, it's still here. It's still out there actually as well. But it's in here this morning. And we just need to reach out to him. We just need to call on him this morning. And I'm going to invite the worship team back. Thanks guys. But as we worship at the end of this service, some of us just need to remind ourselves of that this morning. That as we look at our circumstances, 
we can feel so overwhelmed and so overcome. I've ha- honestly, I've had a week where that's happened, where I've just looked at what's going on in our lives and in our family and thought, oh, where are we going with this? We just need the power of mighty God and to call on Jesus to come work in our lives, to come call on him to come um, just be with us, to walk through whatever it is we're going through, whether it's reconciliation, whether it's healing, whether it's finances, whatever it is, I invite you just to reach out to God this morning to declare over your life that Jesus is mighty God over your lives and to come meet with you right now. And if you're standing on the sidelines this morning looking in on this service, then please know that Jesus is inviting you in. Whether you've never accepted him or you feel like you've just got a little bit lost and you don't really know where he is right now, he is seeking you out. You don't need to find him. He will find you. Jesus came so that we can have an intimate relationship with God and he's not far away. So if you don't know Jesus yet this morning, I would really love to chat with you. There is a a wonderful leadership team here who would also love to chat with you, that we can just pray with you and chat with you and talk to you about our Jesus and what it means to follow him. Thanks, guys.